All right, folks, welcome back to the channel. Once again, of course, I'm doing a live stream with no warning whatsoever, just kind of springing it on my subscribers here. I'd love to hear from you guys today. I want to talk technology. I want to talk what's going on in the world of technology stocks. Some of the exciting things that are coming out uh, right now that I want to talk about is Moderna. There are some very cool things going on with Moderna stock right now that I think are uh, going to be very impressive. Now, this is an investment that I haven't talked a lot about in the past. But uh, I'll be frank with you guys, I've been a holder of Moderna stock for a long time, maybe as long as 10 years. I'd actually have to go back and look at my brokerage account to see that. But I I've been a holder for a long time in that stock and interested in, in mRNA technology for a very, very long time. And I realized today that there are a lot of people that are seriously um, misinformed when it comes to uh, mRNA technology. I'd love to talk with you guys about that today. And talk about what an exciting investment Moderna, Moderna is going to be in the future and uh, other mRNA technology companies are going to be in the future and how much money they are going to make. Uh, so I guess the big exciting news that is out there is going to be that Moderna is starting to conduct their first human trials of an HIV vaccine using mRNA technology. That news just came out in the last week or so, and I think a lot of people didn't realize that. Um, but anyway, I'm here to uh, answer any questions you guys have about that. I'm here to talk about any technology things you want to talk about. I'd love to hear from you guys, uh, but I want to talk. I want to just give you sort of a preview of some of the things that I'd like to talk about today. But of course, the conversation always goes the direction that the comments go, right? So as you comment, I'll start talking about you know the questions that you guys ask. So. Of course, I want to talk a little bit about NEO today. Of course, I want to talk a little bit about Xplung and some of the news regarding that company. And I'd love to talk to you guys more about some genomic stocks. Uh, those are pretty beat up compared to where they were last year. But I have to say that I, it, it's looking more and more like there's a lot of opportunity there. But uh, anyway, it looks like there's four people watching out there. Let me know, or five people watching now. Let me know if you guys can actually hear me what's going on. I, uh, I kind of changed my microphone here. I want to make sure that it actually works. So anyway, shoot with any of your questions that you might have, and uh, I'd be happy to. So Keith X says, has. All right. Not sure what you mean by has. Is this a, uh, a uh, symbol that I should be looking up here or, or what's going on with that? But uh, okay. Hey, what's going on, Keith? Can you hear me? Uh, I just want to make sure that you guys can hear. Awesome. Musa. Okay. How come when it's good news for XPEV, it always finishes a, uh, a red day or close to zero? Well, the, the good news uh, for Xpong actually came out just a couple of days ago. Um, they decided to ship uh, a, a, an order of their P7 sedan to, um, to Norway, which I think is pretty good. They already shipped a couple of their G3s over there. I think about a hundred of their G3s. And their G3 sedan sold well enough. And I know that they've started a project. They've started a project there to create a, um, some infrastructure, some charging infrastructure there as well. And they're shipping that P7. Now, the interesting thing about that P7 shipment that's going over there, that is not the first P7 that is going to go to Norway. They already did some, uh, some winter testing of the vehicle there. They know it performs quite well. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, Last year, I was seeing a couple of articles talking about the uh, lithium iron phosphate bar battery that is in Tesla's vehicles, maybe not performing quite so well in extreme weather conditions. And uh, I have not actually seen any more of those articles. Uh, so this battery that they're using is not that lithium ferrophosphate battery. It's uh, their own um, their own um, lithium uh, manganese cobalt uh, cathode chemistry, I think. I'm not actually sure on that, so so don't quote me. On that, but um, yeah, so that's very exciting. Xplung is looking to establish itself right away as a global player. This is the second thing that they're moving over into Norway. We know that BYD now has shipped the Tang over to uh, to Norway at this point, and I think that's very exciting. And Neo, of course, is uh, I think they've shipped some of their ES eights over there. Uh, did you guys hear the big news about um, BYD though? Uh, they, they're coming out with a small car called the Dolphin. Um, uh, and it's, I, I think it was named the dolphin by, by someone who was writing an article on it, but this article that I was reading was stating that they think that this is going to be the car that, that convinces a lot of people to adopt the electric vehicle. 
So options on this vehicle, put the price range for this BYD vehicle in there. And it's a, it's a hatchback. It's a four-seater, but it's a hatchback. It's not that big. Uh, but it would be something that people would probably buy here. But, you know, Americans don't really like, you know, compact subcompact cars and hatchbacks. That might be uh, changing. But it's made for the Chinese market. The price on that is, is anywhere from $15,000 to $19,000, depending on options. And the range is anywhere from 180 to 250 miles. Uh, that's You get a lot of vehicle for very little money, uh, and, and you get an entry vehicle into the electric market. So I'm pretty excited about that. So, um, But yeah, to, to answer your question, Elon's Ozolent, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I never actually know if I am. Uh, why does it always finish the day in red or close to zero? Partially because it's not really well covered by by media. It, it really isn't. Um, a lot of times when I hunt for articles that are written, it's I'm looking at articles that are translated from Chinese into English. Uh, Gasgu is one of the um, Gasgu uh, Automotive News China is one of the best sources for uh, for news on any Chinese electric vehicle company. And there are tons of them out there that aren't covered in Western media at all. So that's something that um, yeah. So. Keith X says, I heard something about the Chinese government wanting to take shares in Baba, so they drive, the, they drove the price down. Um, well, uh, the Chinese government is not any Western government. I'm, I'm not really sure that they would necessarily have to drive the price down to take share in Baba. They could just nationalize part of Alibaba if they really wanted to. So um, I'm, I'm not sure that's a practice that they would do openly. They might. Um, but no, I, I, the regulatory crackdown is not all a bad thing when it comes to China, right? That one of the big dangers you have in the Chinese economy right now is the development of these really large conglomerates and the creation of monopolies or a duopoly in terms of technology. You're looking at Alibaba and Baidu and, and Tencent Holdings are really three companies that are dominating technology there. They own a slice of the pie, and it seems like just like every other company that's there, like Alibaba owns a slice of Xpeng. Um, they own uh, a slice of just about everything that's out there in terms of LiDAR technology, in terms of AI technology. Baidu is really big into AI. Um, but all these three big conglomerates, they own bits and pieces of just about everything out there. So um, I'm sorry, can you please write in the comments the web page where you get the news? Hold on a second. Um, news. Hold on just a second there. I will be happy to accommodate you here. Um, and if you're using a VPN, by the way, this website does not work at all. Um, and I, I, use, I frequently use a VPN while I'm working. Um, but in the comments right there, you see autonews.gasgoo.com. It's actually a pretty good, uh, you know, pretty good resource out there. Like, I don't know if you guys know that that almost all of these large uh, telecommunications companies also like Xiaomi. They're, I think, the third or fourth largest phone maker on the planet. Um, they also have huge investments in in autonomous driving uh, companies. Uh, Huawei also has huge investments in uh, the Chinese auto market right now. Baidu is the same way. Um, and there's all kinds of Chinese vehicle or Chinese electric vehicle companies out there that you can discover on your own that aren't necessarily traded on U.S. markets here. I'm not here simply to talk about investments. Sometimes I want to just talk about the technology that I'm, that I'm really interested in. Uh, the other thing is this website is, gonna, is going to uh, really touch on all of the industries that are ancillary to the, uh, maybe ancillary is not the right word, but uh, that actually are, you know, that, that are involved in the auto industry as well. Like they cover battery making technology a lot here with articles on CATL, with articles on, on all kinds of things here. So uh, tons of auto companies you may or may not have heard of. There are over 130 different auto brands that are sold in China, 130 domestic brands that are sold in China. So and a lot of people don't realize that, which I think is uh, I think it's pretty amazing, right? Uh, Shoeless Joe says, hi, Jason. Man, you are always on my live streams. You must work from home. <laughs> so <laughs> like I do, I work from home pretty frequently. So um yeah. So also thanks for explaining. Big fan of your videos. Thank you so much. Uh, guys, lately I've been super busy. This is uh, like financial planning season uh, with one of the companies that I work with. So I'm actually doing a lot of actual financial planning with actual clients right now. We're going over like estate planning, kind of boring stuff that I'd love to make videos on. I'm not sure that my audience really wants to hear about revocable uh, living trusts, uh, healthcare directives and healthcare power of attorney. 
but that's something I'll probably make videos on one of these days. And as you guys get wealthier and wealthier, because that is something that I want to talk about too, is how you all get wealthier and wealthier over time. All of that advanced financial planning is going to become a concern for you. So that's something we're going to talk about at some point. But the topic that I really wanted to touch back on today was Moderna stock. Now, uh, like I said earlier in the in the live cast here, Moderna stock, of course, it's it's very famous right now. It's going through the roof right now uh, or has over the last year because of its association with the COVID-19 vaccine. So Pfizer's vaccine just got full FDA approval. Uh, I'm not sure that's well, I'm not sure how meaningful that is at this point. Uh, but we know that um, that Moderna's uh, paperwork is right behind them. They're going to be uh, approved pretty soon as well. Uh, that's all exciting. And I think that's all great news. It's not that meaningful moving forward, though. The vaccine's already out there. Uh, it's already being used. Already, it's already in production. It's already paid for. The money's already hitting their bottom line, right? If we take a look at Moderna right now, they're, according to the last quarter, quarterly earnings, their earnings per share was eight dollars and forty six cents, and their price earnings ratio is is forty seven. Uh, like, I think or forty seven. The price earnings ratio is forty seven, right? I think that this PDE ratio, in a lot of ways, is almost criminally. Uh, this company is almost criminally undervalued, even on almost four hundred dollars a share. And, and let's talk about why that, why that is. Uh, mRNA technology, like messenger RNA technology, is not a new technology. It was first described in a paper in 1988. Uh, genes RNA was first inserted into uh, you know a mouse's genome back in 1990, and I can't remember the name of the name of the name of the paper now. But that original paper that was published in 1990 has been cited over 655 different times going all the way back to papers in 1992. And this technology has evolved in practice since 1992. And this study has evolved since 1992. And since 2011, the CRISPR process made it a lot easier to uh, to build custom RNA, uh, RNA packages basically for delivery. And now there's a lot more experimentation that is, is has been able to be uh, accomplished, right? So they were doing experiments with mRNA technology prior to 2011. It's just become a lot easier since um, since CRISPR technology came out. Now, if you didn't hear the earlier part of this live cast, then you would not necessarily know that six days ago, uh, Moderna started a vaccine trial for HIV, for AIDS, right? Uh, based on messenger RNA technology which I think this this is one of the most costly diseases uh, for all of humanity. And I think this is extremely exciting. They also have a couple of other products that are in trials right now that are related to um, that are related to specific cancers, right? So I don't know if you guys know this or not, but one of the big exciting things about genomic technology is you're going to be able to tailor treatments for these specific mutations that your particular cancer has, right? Some of these mutations are pretty common across cancers, some of them are not, but these types of vaccines have also been in development in uh, in human trials since 2011, and I think it's extremely exciting uh, to talk about that. So if Moderna stock is not something that you have taken a look at yet, and I know it's something that I haven't talked about very much, although I've been a, I've been a holder in that stock for a very long time, um, yeah, I think that you guys should take a look at that again. So not, not getting a lot of questions on that, so I'll move on. It's something, genomics is something that I find enormously um, satisfying to, to think about. And I find it enormously fascinating to, um, to research, but, uh, Sheila's Joe says there, what type of cancers are, uh, are Moderna working on? Uh, I, I can't tell you that off the top of my head. I, I don't remember. I read the names of a couple of them, but I do know that they're working on something like eight, uh, or nine, uh, different cancers right now. Uh, and some of them are actually pretty common, it's a company, right? And the, and the purpose of the company is to make money. It's not simply just to do good things out in the world. So they're probably going to concentrate on the cancers that are most common at this point. So um, Nathan W says, Baidu CEO says they spend more money on R&D than all other uh, EEV, EV companies combined in China. Do you think they'll eventually replace all driving software of the other EVs? I think that's actually a distinct possibility. Um, if you look at the money that... Uh, so, I mean, let, let's face it, the, the original self-driving software that's out there is not exactly a direct ripoff of whatever Tesla made, but um, they, they took that technology and they were able to, without directly copying it, they were able to use that technology. So Neo's original driver assistance programs were, were based on on, on Tesla's technology. Xpeng's original driver assistance programs were based on 
on um, you know the technology derived from um, uh, from Tesla. Not only that, both of those companies have development offices in uh, Silicon Valley, and Xbox actually has a software office here in San Diego too, where I live. So uh, they, they're still working on their own technology, and I'm sure they're still poaching employees from Tesla in order to uh, to obtain trade secrets. That is a that's simply a business practice that happens all the time. You poach the uh, poach talent from people. But there's this whole other layer of talent out there um, that's been working with the telecom companies to do the same thing. There's this whole layer of other talent that's out there. Like I forget the name of the company that's working with PACAR right now, but they're working on self-driving software for uh, long-haul trucking, right? Um, that's this whole other layer of things that are going out there. So uh, I, I think I've shared with you guys before that uh, I have my doubts when it comes to uh, you know artificial intelligence uh, you know, a true AI driving, true level five autonomy here in the next couple of years. I still have my doubts about that. Uh, and that's based on consultations with actual computer scientists who they, they're telling me that this is not possible right now. Um, and from what they're telling me, they're on sort of the bleeding edge of, uh, uh, of, of AI research right now. So I would have to defer to their expertise in this field. That, that is what I do when I speak to an expert I defer to their expertise in this field. So I'm a little more cautious when I'm looking at Tesla stock and evaluating what their future is. I'm a little more cautious about including software sales. I do include, you know, the, the you know, driver assistance at that eight or ten thousand dollar level per vehicle, however many people choose that. Um, I'm not including right now in my value in my evaluation of how much Tesla is going to be worth. I'm not including like uh, autonomous taxi service or anything like that. I'm not sure that's right around the corner like uh, like Ark Invest thinks it is. Um, you know, they they're, they're talking about this being a reality sometime in the next five years. I'm not sure that that really is going to be that way. Uh, and and look, and it doesn't dim my um, expectations of what Tesla is going to do as an investment. I think that in the near future, the very near future, they're going to be producing seven to eight million vehicles a year within the next decade. I think they'll they'll be producing just as many vehicles as GM is today. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that that's not, not far behind. Um, I, I don't have the same expectations that the Chinese electric vehicle companies are going to be dominating the market like 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 uh, like a GM did in the past or like a Tesla will in the future. Um, the Chinese market is very different. In order for them to do that, they really have to branch out outside of, of China, right? They have to export their vehicles. They have not had any success, really, not any real success with Chinese vehicles out or, you know, internal combustion engine vehicles exported outside of China in large numbers. Um, everything they did was a miserable failure. Now, granted, they were, you know, they really just started making uh, their own cars for, for you know, for uh, civilian purposes back in like 97 or 98 or something. The first privately owned auto manufacturers were really in like 97 or 98. And for a number of years, they weren't making tremendous progress in terms of their ability to manufacture. That all changed right around 2012, 2013. And they've been on this upward climb in terms of, of, of technology, right? So um, I actually have a bit harder road to hoe than Tesla will when it comes to breaking into, yeah, so uh, breaking into international markets, partially because um, I think just the fear of buying a Chinese vehicle, that, that's number one. I do think, though, that NIO has quite an advantage just because of their name and the way their branding is. I like their, their simple, uh, elegant branding, um, and, I, and I like the way they wrap in NIO House into their product offering. I think that that could have some legs in certain foreign markets, um, maybe not necessarily here in the United States, but I do think that uh, – you know, that, that could happen. Um, uh, Keith X says, I don't quite understand the fear of Chinese stocks listed through VIE. If BABA is also listed in Hong Kong and they are convertible. Well, uh, the issue is, Keith, it's not really clear that they're going to be convertible in the case of a uh, of delisting, right? Um, and it's all, and, 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 yeah, so it's not really clear that they're going to be convertible in that case. Uh, we don't actually know what's going to happen right now. Uh, I do want to express that 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 the fear of delisting for me is a growing concern. I'm have not taken any action whatsoever, um, you know, because of that. I, I just would like to say that I wish there was more progress negotiating a solution for this, and there isn't. the The current administration is far too distracted by other problems to even think about this, or uh, at least if they are in negotiations, it hasn't. We're, we're not seeing any news of that. So, 
Um, do you have any thoughts on UiPath, the software company focused on automation that Arc uh, F is invested in? Um, that is something I'm actually researching right now, and I, I don't have thoughts that I'm sure enough to really share uh, on air right now. Um, so, that, what what are the things when I'm looking at the uh, the the different automation software companies that that um, Arc Invest is invested in? I'm looking in particular the AI focused. Um, companies that they're invested in. There's not as much AI in the AI companies that we're looking at, right? Uh, one of the big ones, of course, was uh, w w was that they were invested in earlier. I'm not sure that they're invested in now. Was uh, Lemonade, where they supposedly had this giant AI uh, mechanism or, or you know this this software complement that was going to help them to underwrite loans. Well, as it turns out, there was a lot, a lot less AI in that entire process, and there was a lot more human intervention, and therefore a lot more uh, labor cost in there than they originally anticipated. So I think some of the results from Lemonade have been a little bit disappointing uh, because of that. But I think that AI for a lot of these companies is being oversold. Uh, they're not really making the progress that they're talking about. Like so, C3.AI is is one of those companies that I'm taking a look at right now. Of course, I'm always taking a look at Palantir. We can talk about Palantir. I think you guys know that this is not my, my favorite subject. Uh, I have worked in, in data analytics uh, for, I, I worked in data analytics for some time. Now granted things were done far differently uh, when, when I looked at them, but I had an opportunity recently to sit down and actually see um, how Palantir software worked in a financial setting. And, and I have to say it's uh, elegant for what it does. What surprised me is, is the fact that um, that that the actual analytics, it's really a visualization tool, and the actual analytics are done by uh, by, by your own engineers uh, who who uh, are plugged into the software. So there was actually far less of a drag and drop product than I thought it was, and it was far more of like think Microsoft Visio. I don't know if you guys are even old enough to have used Microsoft Visio, where you could draw out how databases were related at that time, and it would show you. Uh, so it would show you like correlations between databases where you didn't actually have like a, re a relational thing where meaning there wasn't one column that was the same in the other in the other um in the other uh table but they would show you where there were correlations there right so that was very interesting and what we were looking at of course we were suspicious um financial transactions in this case and it did pull up some interesting insights but those insights that it pulled up weren't actually programmed by Palantir itself. It was actually done by a third-party developer who was using, uh, who was developing the insights from what Palantir was showing them on a, on a visualized basis. So it was both more impressive visually than I thought it was going to be, but less impressive from, uh, from a product, right? It really isn't a product. Uh, it's a visualization tool. And then you have to devise, you have to devise your own, um, your own, uh, programs around that, which that was the disappointing thing for me. So I think they do a really good job of selling their mystique. And I think they do a really good job with PR. I, I want to see results in terms of, of, of growing revenues so before I get too excited about this company. So, uh, okay. So um, Sheila Joe says, uh, all right. So in terms of questions, you guys aren't real talkative today. So feel free to ask me anything that is uh, technology related um, and if I don't know what I'm talking about, I will just say, I don't know what you're talking about. If you guys have been a long-term, a long-term listener of, uh, my live streams, you know, that I'm perfectly happy admitting when I don't know something. Um, and, and let's talk about that for a minute. Like I had a Facebook conversation. I shouldn't get on Facebook guys. Uh, I'd kind of sworn off social media for a while because to be honest with you, I'm kind of mean on Facebook. So don't, don't friend me on Facebook because I don't want you to see what I say to people. And I've been off of it for a while because uh, I, I didn't find it very good psychologically, but uh, I made a point today talking about uh, some of the alternative treatments for, um, for uh, you know, COVID and how people are going crazy over this uh, heart deworming medicine. Now uh, this horse deworming medicine now, and, and just made it the point to talk about how people are, you know, giving me links to studies and quoting things from the abstract. And I realized that 99.9% .9 of the people out there, they're sending me a link. They've read the title, they've read the abstract, but they never actually looked at the data that's in these studies. And they never, and they either read the study and didn't understand it, or they didn't read the study, right? This happens a lot when it comes to science reporting. 
uh, science reporting really is, is is not that great. You're always subject to the whims and the biases of the person that is doing the reporting. And you're also subject to the limitations of the person that is doing the reporting. If you see an article on a subject in, a subject in science that you really like, I highly encourage you to actually go and pull the actual study that that is based on. Sometimes those studies, if they're in science or they're in nature or something like that, they are not available to the public. So I'm going to let you in on the secret right here, right? This is, this. you know, there's always like these trading secrets that people think that they have, it, but they don't actually exist. There's no such thing as a, as a secret trading system. And most trading systems don't work anyway. But this is a secret that does work. Even if that scientific study is behind a paywall, most of the time, all you have to do is find out who the author of that study is and email them and say, you want to read their study. You're just a general member of the public. You want to read their study because you're curious because you read an article on it. And in most cases, those scientists are absolutely thrilled to send you a PDF copy of their study. They don't get paid for publishing these studies in Science or Nature magazine. Uh, all they want is for the data, for their data to be seen, right? So, uh, yeah, if you're really curious about something in the science world, find out who the authors of that study are, even if it's behind a paywall, and just email them. They would love to hear from you. And I've done this hundreds of times over the years. And somebody first told me this like way back in like 2006 or something like that. And I thought it was just amazing that people would just give me their work. Uh, but they did. And they were happy to do that. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, Elon's also says, I know it might be out of to topic, but what do you think about Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit going public? Um. Man, it's not really out of subject, right? Uh, I am one of those people that has long waited for space to be economically exploited in one way or another. I just didn't think that that tourism was going to be a way to do it. I guess I had a really impractical vision of what was going to happen. Like, I thought that at some point we would maybe be out mining asteroids or something like that, or constructing giant solar arrays and microwaving energy back down to... Um, you know, to the planet instead of burning fossil fuels. I just didn't expect tourism essentially to be what, uh, you know, what, what is driving space, space exploration at this point. So, um, you know, private space exploration or private you know, space uh, payload, uh, you know, moving has really been all done by, by, by SpaceX uh, recently. I think it's exciting now that SpaceX has a little bit more competition um, and, and with Blue Origin as well. I think that going public, though, I, I wonder how many years away they are from consistent revenues, not just profit, just consistent revenues. I think if you're looking to invest in, in um, Virgin Galactic, uh, you're going to have plenty of opportunities over the next couple of years to invest in this company um, when, when it hits lows. I, I wouldn't this is not something I'd be thinking about doing right now. Um and this is another one of the, one of those companies that went public by SPAC probably far sooner than it should have. So uh, Blue Origin as well. Man, why is uh, why is uh, Jeff Bezos so hated right now? Um, is it because all of his workers make minimum wage and he got to go to space this year? I don't know. But um, I think it's very interesting all the hate that the guy gets. Uh, and, and there are certainly things you can say on, on that about how much his workers are paid versus how much he makes, whatever. There's certain things you can say. I do think, though, that space exploration in any dimension is, is kind of exciting, even if you're talking about just space tourism. Now, how do you turn space tourism into a profitable business? I don't think that you can really turn that into a profitable business. There's going to have to be some sort of business angle there, uh, meaning you're gonna we're, we're going to be putting more satellites into space. We're going to be, like I said, possibly building solar arrays in space. I don't know. But that is something that, I, that I'm very curious to see. Uh, and you guys, if you haven't watched my live streams before, you'll figure out that I'm just a very, very curious person. I'm also perfectly willing to change my mind on just about anything based on new data that's presented. So if you guys uh, want to call me out on something that you think that is wrong, feel free to do so. And we can discuss that either on this live stream or we can do that offline. That's completely up to you. But uh Talk to me a little bit about your concerns right now. Is inflation still a concern for you guys? Is uh, is that something that is uh, that you're still worried about? Um, if you guys haven't paid attention, a couple of things uh, that were highly inflated earlier this year, like uh, like lumber, 
Uh, now you have suppliers sitting on lumber supplies. Lumber futures have pretty much crashed at this point. So any thoughts on drone delivery? Man, that's another that's another like exciting topic. Uh, so I think it's going to happen, even though I'm actually going to hate that day. Uh, and, and I'll tell you why. I have a, a neighbor with like four kids that lives in their house and they all have their own freaking drones. And uh, that is extremely loud. And it actually moves more air than you think. And my neighbors don't live that close to me. It's really loud. Uh, so I can, uh, and and I'll be honest with you guys, I work from home. I have the freedom to take afternoon naps when I want to. There's been many a day when my afternoon nap has been ruined by the sound of my neighbors playing with their drones. Um, I can only imagine how that's going to occur um, because the drones are just loud. I can only imagine what's going to occur when we have pizza being delivered by drones, when we have all your Amazon packages being delivered by, by drones. So uh, thoughts on drone delivery, though? I think that just uh, based on practicality, Amazon is probably the company that's going to lead that. And if they have any competition in this area, they're going to buy that competition. So um, I think that your best approach to this would be to um, to figure out who the companies that you think are going to get uh, acquired by Amazon are. I think that would be the easiest way to do that. So. Shoeless Joe says, I think the reason Bezos is hated because no one has done more to kill the high street. Uh, that may be a colloquialism that I am not familiar with. More to kill the high street. So, um, and hi, Jason. Do you know anything about the SV Aero Farm? Very interesting concept. I don't think that I do. What is the SV Aero Farm? And um, I don't think, no, I don't actually think that I've covered that at all. So I do see, yeah. So, ver uh, Okay, leader in vertical farming. Uh, okay, so I do know quite a bit about um, about hydroponics and in particular aquaponics. I was very interested in aquaponics for a couple of years and even built a couple of my own uh, test aquaponics gardens. Um, but no, this is not a company that I'm familiar with. Uh, I'm taking, I'm actually very interested in this now that you pointed that out though. It's something that I'm going to take a look at. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that these solutions in terms of more intelligent use of land and more intelligent use of water in particular, particularly here in the Southwest where I live, where, um, you know, Imperial County in the United States in, in Southern California is one of the uh, most productive farm or farmlands in the entire world, not just the United States, but they use enormous amounts of water. And that water is piped in from the Colorado river and the Colorado river is drying up. So, I could certainly see um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these solutions becoming more and more practical as time goes on, especially um, in, in light of climate change happening. It, it's happening, whether you believe in it or not. It's actually happening. Uh, in fact, the, the data is there to prove that. Um, whether or not it's human cause, I'm not going to get into that. But the but the, the world is heating up, and we are going to see changes in the way um, the way weather patterns work. And I think that. Um, I think that you you are correct that vertical farming may be more important in the future. So uh, Elon says Virgin Galactic tickets will cost $450,000 and they see uh, each flight, they will generate 3 million if they reach a goal of 400 flights per year. And that's a pretty big pile of money in the pocket. And so how many people, uh, this is a company that I haven't really looked at um, that closely because like I said, I'm not interested so much in the tourist aspect of it, but how many people can afford a $450,000 flight? Um, now I know there's lots of millionaires in the world and there's lots of billionaires in the world, uh, lots of them. Uh, but I, I do think, um, yeah, I, I don't know if they're going to manage 400 flights a year. I really don't. So uh, Keith X says, I run a retail business. Every new delivery, there's a new price. I was told that the current price from containers in China is uh, about 25,000 each. So uh, part of that is due to reflation in the economy, but also part of that is due to the fact that they keep shutting down uh, ports in China whenever they find uh, you know, a large COVID cluster. So that that's part of what's going on there. Um, that's not gonna last forever. We have plenty of containers around the world. We have plenty of ships around the world. Like, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember or we're in the stock market to remember. Remember back around 2010, 2011, uh, dry goods uh, tippers like the like shipping companies, all like all these Greek companies, they were paying massive dividends at the time, and their stocks were going through the roof. And of course, they all cratered at some point. Uh, but but the reality is, uh, none of those companies went anywhere. They're still around. Their stocks still cratered. They we still have the volume to ship things that are out there. So, 
Um, are you concerned about high about interest rates going up? And um, hold on a second. Uh, are you concerned about interest rate going up? It's having a detrimental impact on high growth and high priced earnings um, EV stocks. Uh, yeah, I am. Um, so, so I've been involved in investing for a very, very long time. And, uh, and, and mostly from the retail end where I interact with people who want to invest or in a lot of cases don't want to invest, meaning they may have been referred to me, but they don't, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't really want to be involved in the stock market. And uh, you'd be surprised how many people, if I met someone in 2006, when the stock market was was looking pretty good, try to get them to invest, they would look at me like, why would I be, want to be in the stock market? I could just get a CD, a six-month CD for 5%. Why would I want to take any risk whatsoever to get 7 8 12% returns when I can get 5% for no risk? Um, so those people are still looking for yield. Yield crashed in 2008, and it never really came back. We haven't seen short-term interest rates uh, you know, for six-month or year-long CDs over 1.5%, 2% in, in like, Almost, uh, you know, almost two decades at this point. Well, getting, getting close to a decade and a half at this point. So, um, well, guys. Uh, so, my point is, is that there are millions of people who are in the stock market and are taking risk, who would probably rather not be in the stock market. They would rather have a six-month CD making five percent. Now, if you're the kind of person who's tuning into my channel, this idea might seem crazy to you, and it might seem ludicrous to you. I'm actually telling you there are hundreds of millions of people out there in the U.S. economy or uh, in the Western economy who are extremely risk adverse. And the only reason they're invested in stocks at all is because there is no yield in anything else. There is no yield in treasuries. There's no yield in corporate bonds. There's a little bit of yield in junk bonds at this point. And uh, dividends have actually been declining for the last 25 years. So dividends used to be like dividends from dividend stocks used to be 40% of the total return of an investment portfolio. Uh, meaning that if you were thinking that, um, you know, it, basically if you were expecting a 5% return on an extremely conservative uh, portfolio, that 2% of that would come from dividend and 3% of that would come from growth, right? So extrapolate that into today, like a moderately aggressive portfolio based on like modern portfolio theory is probably expected to do something like 7.84% over time. Uh, and uh, in the past, it probably would have been expected to do more like nine. It's because of that decline in, in yields with interest rates being so low. Uh, there's been no incentive for a lot of these companies to uh, increase their dividend yield. And they've been taking some of that savings and going out and doing share repurch repurchase, and that's been propping up uh, share prices. For some of these companies that I consider value traps that are out there on the S&P 500, and there's a lot of companies out there on the S&P 500 that are value traps at this time. You think these companies are on sale, but the reality is they're actually slowly, slowly failing, right? Um, so yeah, I am concerned that high interest rates, um, but it's going to take a long time for interest rates to rise. Um Typically, interest rates might go up a quarter percent per quarter to sort of lessen the shock of, uh, of, of rising interest rates. It actually provides you a lot of opportunity to start trading uh, on a fixed income portfolio. This is one of the things I used to do a lot of, which uh, was, was fixed income trading. I haven't done um, I haven't done a lot of uh, fixed income trading lately just because it's been so freaking boring, right? There's, a, there's not a lot of money to be made unless you're trading in extreme volumes. When you trade in extreme volumes, you have to do a lot of trading, and I don't find that interesting. So I, I tend to push that type of client onto someone else because I don't like dealing with that. Uh, the, con the constant trading is kind of boring to me. So uh, I was thinking of investing in American Water Works. I think that I actually owned that stock a long time ago. Um yeah, I think I actually owned that stock a long time ago. And it, it was, uh, I'm not sure. I don't own it now. I don't think I do. But I think I owned that a long time ago. And I bought it based on an article that I read. Uh, I think it was uh, like a Motley Fool article. Like, I, I know a lot of people that love the Motley Fool. A lot of people that, 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 that love, um, you know, those two guys. But I can tell you one thing. Whenever I have followed their advice or gotten very excited about an article that they've, they've read, uh, they've written it's come back to burn me, right? I'm not saying that all their advice is bad. They're not. I know people that love these guys, right? Uh, my experience with that uh, has been negative, though, and I tend not I tend not to, to listen to any of these uh, pundits that are out there anymore anyway, guys. Sorry, I keep getting a lot of calls. Um, 
Yeah, so Elon Ozelin says 20 million millionaires, so there are a lot of people who could afford it. You know, the problem with this, Elon, is that uh, a lot of millionaires aren't multimillionaires, and a lot of millionaires got became millionaires by being extremely frugal, right? There are far more people that uh, just own their own business and were frugal and saved and invested their way into being millionaires. So in the United States alone, something like 80% of all millionaires in the United States, and this is actually a research that was done by Dave Ramsey. Um, I'm not by his group, right? Uh, it's solid research. I'm not a huge fan of Dave Ramsey, but this is solid research. But in the United States, 80% of millionaires are first generation millionaires in the United States, meaning that they are first generation millionaires. This uh, country creates a lot of opportunity for upward mobility for a lot of different people. Like the the old saying that that all wealth is based on luck. It, well, I mean, a lot of wealth is based on luck. Don't get me wrong. But most of it's not even the case that most of it is inherited. So 90% of millionaires are actually worth between one and $5 million. So, right? One and $5 million. If I have $5 million, I don't think I'm going to spend $450,000 on, on an 11 minute trip into space. I really don't. Uh, and a lot of these guys, I'm sure some people would, but you know, not, I think 90% of those millionaires that are out there, that cost of $450,000 for a ticket to go to space for 11 minutes, that's going to be pretty high, right? Uh, and I forget the uh, the actual name of that article that was on Dave Ramsey's website where I read this, but actually I think I, I did a, yeah, I did a video a long time ago. It's a terrible video, but I'm sure it's still on, on uh, my channel here, but 14 facts about millionaires. And uh, at least six of those facts came from came from Dave Ramsey's research, and the rest of them came from a couple of other, other articles that I read where they researched uh, millionaires. But uh, and and that was one of the big points there is that most millionaires are worth between one and five million, right? You just don't have that many people who I think are going to drop four hundred fifty thousand dollars for a ticket on Virgin Galactic or on Blue Origin to do that. They've got to find some sort of commercial angle outside of space tourism. Um, yeah. So and Keith. X, I also run a couple of retail businesses. I am having trouble getting the supplies that I need right now, like basic things. Like I can't get t-shirt blanks to make t-shirts. I can't get the geese that I that I that I need. I can't get patches that I need, you know, on uh, for the geese. And uh, a lot of that, I mean, and this in and in particular, those businesses, I don't have a lot of juice to like kick people on the butt and get them moving either. So I feel your frustration when it comes to to retail right now. Uh, luckily, I'm not paying tons of money for it, uh, for extra shipment. I just can't. I literally cannot get the things that I need right now. So, um, yeah. So, um, Chris says, what amount of any given portfolio would you allocate to Chinese stocks given the current political environment? Um, so, the current political environment that I'm concerned with is actually not the Chinese political environment. It's the American political environment. We're not making any progress on negotiating a trade solution with China at this point. Uh, the Trump administration left that completely unfinished. They have a trade deal where they have part one signed, which China is not uh, not uh, abiding to at all. And it, was, and it basically has no teeth because we never signed the enforcement part of that. Uh, and when they're not negotiating anything in terms of um, you know, the delisting and making them more, or making these Chinese companies that are listed on American exchanges more in line with our generally accepted accounting principles. So um, I would suggest that I'm basically, I have so much money in Chinese stocks right now by accident, meaning I bought a lot for very, very little back in the day. Um, so you shouldn't take my portfolio as a guideline, but I would probably not allocate more than five or six percent of uh, you know any of my clients' portfolios to China, and that would be a that would be if they wanted a really large portion of their portfolio in emerging markets. And yes, I still consider China to be in many ways an emerging market. Part of it is because of the inherent volatility, right? But you can read several articles out there talking about Chinese investments right now, where some people are saying China is uninvestable, and other. Uh, investment firms out there are saying this is business as usual for China. I actually tend to um, fall on the side of this is business as usual for China, right? They are trying to create, they already have tons of, of uh, uh, you know, financial regulations, but they're dealing with something that they've never had to deal with in their, in their, in their recent past before, where, which are these large conglomerates that control massive amounts of the Chinese economy and, and threaten really the, the very, 
few liberties that some of these uh, the, the Chinese citizens have, right? So uh, I, I do think that this is business as usual to a degree. It's not something to get uh, the regulations and the crackdown are really not something to get panicked about. And I think that we're going to see 2020 like levels on Chinese stocks here probably within the next year. I think there's some tremendous opportunity out there, particularly. Uh, well, I think Tencent is probably going to get targeted next and slapped down a little bit um, just because they seem to have they're the one company that has their fingers in everything. Right. Um, but I think that Baidu, I think that Alibaba, I think that Xiaomi, I think that. Um, but I just can't think of the other companies off the top of my head right now. Uh, but I think all of these companies are going to, they're probably 30, 40, maybe yeah, 30 or 40% undervalued at this point. Uh, and I, in particular, I was looking at, um, at Baidu recently, you know, you could have bought Baidu at like a hundred and, uh, well, maybe it was like $148 a share two days ago or something like that. Uh, but it was it was really cheap. And it's down from something like $240 a share back in uh, back in February. There's tremendous opportunity here if you have the guts to stick it out. Like if you have the guts to stick it out. So uh, any thoughts on China controlling their companies like Alibaba? Um, so, I mean, they're not uh, a democracy, man. And uh, they're not communist either. There's something that uh, we don't really have a good name for um, in uh, uh, something that's really hard for us to describe. Like if you have a stock market and you have private ownership of businesses, you're not communist, right? But you're not like us either, right? They don't have any real protection from the, the, the government. I think that you may see the Chinese government taking a stake in a lot of companies uh, here in the future. Oh, this is something that's uh, high street refers to the shopping areas in the UK. Okay. That's something I wasn't familiar with. Uh, you guys might not know this. Uh, so I, I speak a couple of languages, but sometimes I feel like uh, English is the one language that I don't speak that well. So, okay. Um, could you see crypto and DeFi replacing the current financial system within the next 10 years? Man, uh, let me tell you, I think that the one problem that I had with, uh, with cryptocurrency actually was the ability to use leverage. Uh, that is, I'm looking at, and geez, I can't, I posted this in my Patreon group recently. Um, and I just can't remember the name of the company, but I posted this into the Discord chat in my Patreon group uh, about this company that's creating a marketplace for loans on, on, on cryptocurrency, meaning that it, it's going to be everything. The bank is going to be a cryptocurrency bank, basically, but it's going to operate just like a regular bank, except it's going to use a smart contract where you're going to be able to go and get a home loan through that and use leverage. You're going to be able to go to business loan and, and you'll be able to get personal loans, whatever you need. Uh, if that really comes to be and we not necessarily solve the trilemma, which is scalability, uh, security, and, and decentralization, um, but if that trilemma, at least two of those three legs, you know, security and scalability are, are solved, uh, I, I really think that a lot of um, uh, a lot of regular investors really aren't all that concerned about decentralized. Uh, decentralization. I, I'm really concerned with, with decentralization, right? I'm really concerned with that. Most of them, I think, are really concerned with scalability and security. Scalability and security are going to be solved here relatively soon. Uh, and if you look at like Cardano is, is doing a great job of, so Cardano is being developed a little bit differently than instead of publishing white papers and going, they actually do things by consensus and by vote. So they'll, they've been a little bit more slow to develop but their network is pretty capable. Um, you know, they're, like they're, they're built as an Ethereum killer. I don't know that that's actually going to happen. Ethereum, you know, their market cap, it's the second largest market cap out there. But I, I do think that DeFi is going to replace a lot of the financial system out there uh, for a couple of reasons. There are a lot of people that are just financial contrarians to a degree like, like I am. I would love to uh, do all of my, my business and finance in, in a way that is, in a DeFi way. I don't even know how to define that at this point. Um, but I don't necessarily see, I read an article recently where someone was talking about crypto replacing, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, regular currencies here in the next five years. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that crypto and DeFi is going to replace the current financial system in the next 10 years, but I think a large portion of it, a significant portion of it could be replaced sometime in the next 10 years. Um, so, and, and, and let's be clear here. I, I do hold, uh, to, just to reflect my biases here, uh, to tell you about them. I do hold Cardano. Uh, I do hold Algorand. I do hold Ethereum. And I do have some Bitcoin. It's not a ton of money, though. Um, they could go up quite a bit. and I'm not going to be rich from it. 
um, because I haven't seen it necessarily as an asset class, but really more as a curiosity up until now. It's real money now, uh, which I wasn't expecting, but it's not something that's a huge portion of my, my portfolio. It's a technology that I'm extremely interested in, um, but I'm not as invested in it as I would like, as maybe I would like to be. So can you talk about new technology and EDs, like how it's being suppressed by the pandemic and how they were flourish soon? I, I don't know that it's being suppressed by the pandemic. In fact, I think that uh, the adoption of EV technology may have, have actually been helped by the pandemic, right? Uh, meaning there was a lot more attention on that because of all the press that uh, that Tesla got, because of all the people that were sitting on on board watching like Battery Day. I was thrilled by Battery Day, man. That was one of the most. That was my. It's. I think it was in September. That was hugely exciting. There was nothing else exciting in my life in September, uh, back in September. Um, but I, I don't necessarily believe that it's being suppressed. Like in this country, we have very powerful entrenched interests when it comes to oil who are convinced a large portion of the population that electric vehicles are stupid, right? Uh, and I come from oil country. I hear this all the time that electric vehicles are stupid. And and, and I, I look at these people as, as Luddites at this point. You are, are not doing yourself a favor by resisting technology. There are a lot of people that are my age and even a little bit younger in their 40s who are involved in the oil industry, um, they are going to be jobless here in the next 10 years. Now, they're used to the, the boom and bust cycle of being in the oil industry, meaning when oil is hot, you're at work. When oil is over $60 a barrel, you're at work in Texas. When it goes below $60 a barrel, you're probably tending bar somewhere. What they don't realize is over the next 10 to 20 years, many of those jobs are not going to come back. Um, we're going to 49% of all end use of petroleum in this country is from passenger light passenger vehicles. Another 12% of that, is, 13% of that is air travel, and another 8% of that is uh, long-haul trucking, and about 5% of that is uh, maritime shipping. So for various reasons, maritime shipping, most of that's not going away. Like you may see a reduction from 5% down to 4%. Most of that inner, uh, most of that voyage across the ocean is going to be done using, using di diesel fuel or something. Maybe 10 miles from port, they switch to battery and they run on batteries, but that's or maybe hydrogen or something like that. But that's not that's not going away. Uh, in terms of long haul trucking, I think a lot of that end use of petroleum is going away. In terms of light passenger vehicles, I think most of that is is going away. Um, and I was reading a recent study that said that that about 26 percent of petroleum use in the United States is not related to transportation. That's still going to be around. Most of that is actually plastics manufacturing. Um, yeah, so uh, most of that is plastics manufacturing. That's not necessarily going away, but we have algae-based solutions right now, like algae-based plastics that are being that are in development all over the world right now in Israel and United States in particular. There are a lot of companies that are working on this. Man, uh, I don't know if you guys have checked out. Uh, uh, the ETF, and, and it's just an index ETF, but but ARK Invest is so impressed with uh, Israel's research community that they have, you know, an, an ETF that's just based on, on Israel. And it's literally just an index ETF. It's not actively managed or anything, or at least it wasn't actively managed last time I looked. But that is a country that produces a lot of scientific research. There are a lot of really brilliant, brilliant minds out there. Um, but yeah, so that, that is one of the things I encounter kind of on a daily basis because I, where I was from originally, um, where, where I grew up, is a, a lot of people that are in, involved in the oil industry. I'm looking at you right now and the same sort of white collar, you know, blue collar apocalypse that happened in the 1970s, uh, the same type of white collar apocalypse that's going to happen due to automation, uh, that very same sort of industry apocalypse is going to happen in the oil industry. There's going to be a lot of people that, uh, that get left behind because they refuse to adapt to uh, to the newer green technologies. They refuse to adapt to, I mean, think about all the things that are going away. Like most of your gas stations are going away. They're not going to convert into charging stations because every time you leave your home, your car is going to be fully charged. It's charging all night, right? Um, and, and I was, somebody posted a ridiculous meme on my, uh, to, on my Facebook feed saying that, that, uh, you know, that, that, that two people in the same block couldn't charge their car at the same time. It's, folks, it's not like they're going to have a supercharger in their car. You're basically using your dryer plug. Uh, it's not quite that simple, but it's the same circuit that your dryer plug is on to charge your car. It's not like you can't have everybody in the block running their dryer at the same time. You absolutely can, right? So, um, yeah, people just don't understand how far along we are in terms of the, the EV revolution and the fact that every manufacturer 
is planning to switch to EVs because the margins are going to be so much higher. They're in business to make money. The margins are going to be so much higher on these electric vehicles that they're more than willing to uh, to make that switch because that's where they believe they're going to make the money. Um, so American EVs more specifically. Uh, yeah, so I, I hope I kind of went over that. Like, I think the resistance here to American EVs is really sort of prompted by uh, the oil industry. Uh, I recall saying that you traded through the dot-com bubble and then the experience of this period shaped you to, more, uh, to be more diligent in your investing approach. Do you see a repeat of this happening again? So the, the dot-com bubble um, was kind of special uh, because if you look at the the the, the S&P 500 in that time period, the S&P 500 was down 9% in, in 2000. It was down 11% in 2001. And it was down 22% in 2002. It wasn't a flash crash. This was three years of misery. But um, in terms of being a good stock picker or a good stock trader in that time period, and mostly being a good stock picker and buying and holding your stocks, there were a lot of active money managers that made a lot more money than um, than uh, index than the indexes did in that time period, because uh, that was like like financials did really really well in that time period. And I worked in the financial industry, so of course I'm I'm exposed to a lot of financial stocks. So I did really really well because of that. Um, but a few things, and I think you may be referring to um, the uh, the Lucent Technologies stock debacle. I don't know if you guys remember Lucent Technologies, but Lucent Technologies had one of the most amazing uh, advertising programs that I've ever seen. They were uh, advertised on, on every television station. They popped up every time I logged into my computer and they talked about how they were changing the world. And I bought Lucent stock at something like $80 a share uh, because, man, I'm like, this company's going to change the world just like Enron. I'll, I'll get to that. I was actually working working as a contractor for Enron in that time period, too. Um but I, I own that stock and it dropped down to like $50 a share or something like that. And uh, I sold the stock. And after I sold the stock, I ended up kind of doing a retrospective and, and saying, why did I buy this to begin with? And I realized that I didn't have any idea what Lucent made. It turns out they made office telephone systems. How are you going to change the world with office telephone systems? Especially when like most of them were wired handheld systems, right? Uh, Lucent Technologies, I don't really think the brand is even around anymore, is even used, but that was one of those things, key moments when I when I was like, you cannot pay attention to the hype. You actually have to investigate what the company makes, what the future of that product is, what the future of that industry is, and how likely they are to actually be a major player in that industry. And it's very hard to know all of those things at, at, at one time. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. Or... See, I recall you saying we're doing the post out or taking, hold on, or taking my questions. I will have to finish watching a video tomorrow, 2 a.m. where I live. Oh, it's 2 a.m. where you live. Okay. All right. Considering going live, consider going live earlier. Um, Ellens, where where are you actually? So um, yeah, let me know where you, what country you're in. I do tend to have a lot of like foreign um subscribers, which I was not expecting when I started this. Uh Keith says I bought Algo the last time you mentioned it, leave it for retirement. Uh, yeah, so so Algorand has a lot of the characteristics that we want to see in that uh, in solving that trilemma of, of scalability, security, and in decentralization, right? Uh, they're a little bit less. Um, so the, their decentralization is a little bit less clear to me. I, I need to to do a little bit more research on that. So I own uh, not quite a bit of algorithm or Alg uh, uh, Algorand, but I own some. One of the things is I'm staking it. And so I'm, I'm making some money on it. Uh, the price has been pretty volatile. It's been anywhere from uh, from from 80 cents all the way up to like a dollar 15 recently. I don't pay uh, <laughs> I don't pay that much um, attention to the price on a day to day basis. Uh, but the Cardano like exploded recently, and and I wasn't expecting that just from uh, a software update. But after reading more uh, into that, I do understand why it's 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 like that. So Quantum Fuji says. Algo Fi sounds like the crypto bank that you mentioned. That's not it. I just can't remember the name. Uh, like I said, I posted the article into my um, into my Patreon group because that company is planning to go public probably third or fourth quarter of this year. So more likely fourth quarter of this year or first quarter of next year. Shoeless Joe says, sorry for throwing English terms at you, man. I forget you guys have the block system and no high street. So uh, yeah, that, that's actually true. Well, Somebody like me, I wasn't even raised in a uh, a large city. I was raised out in the country. So when people tell me like, "Oh, it's ten blocks away," like 
I, I have a hard time visualizing what that actually means. So even the block system is, is kind of is kind of weird for me. Like intellectually, I know what a block is, but I have trouble visualizing what that distance actually means. Like I have no trouble visualizing in my head how far a kilometer is and how far a mile is. I know most Americans can't conceive of how far a kilometer is, uh, but uh, but yeah. So the block system is something that I, I'm not I'm not familiar with a lot of urban terms. So Dubzatron says I miss so much of the stream. Hey, man, uh, sorry about that. I'm sorry that I never give you guys any warning whatsoever about the streams. I literally do it. I'm pretty busy. I literally do this just when I have an hour of free time and uh, or, or so. Um, yeah. Speaking of uh, crypto-based assets, how much do you know about NFTs? Do you think it's a fad? I know calling that uh, an asset is a debacle. Hey, you know, I'm actually going to do a video with someone who's a little bit more of an NFT expert here pretty soon. He's actually someone who's been a long-term uh, watcher of my channel. Uh, he has a job in the crypto space right now, and he's a lot more familiar with, uh, you know, uh, with NFTs than I am. And I'm going to, it's going to be more of a, a round robin sort of interview style thing, but I am going to do that. And and he'll give you guys a really good picture of what uh, NFTs look like. Is it a fad? I think certain things are fad. You know, you can look at um, some of the things like the, the NFT rocks that are being sold right now, man, that's like a Dutch tulip. If I ever saw a Dutch tulip, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, then go and Google the Dutch tulip crisis of the 1600s. Um, people were paying the equivalent, the modern equivalent of a million dollars for tulips back in the 1600s. By the way, they're still doing that. They still pay almost that amount of money for perfect tulips. Uh, that has actually not gone away. So uh, Dubstron actually says, I looked into Tencent and the American money actually went in uh, and all the American money that went into their fundraising. There's, there's ton of it. Uh, there really is. Um, uh, same with Baidu. Uh, Tobu NS, NCS says, instead of picking specific EV stocks, what do you think about buying a lithium mining ETF? Um, so it's that's so buying a lithium mining ETF, while it seems like it's always the obvious thing to do, uh, when you look at raw material suppliers, a, a lot of times they're, they're kind of at the, at the very end of that, uh, of that long manufacturing chain. And a lot of times, uh, they kind of get screwed out. They get eventually screwed out of their share of that, uh, of that, uh, business just through negotiation and, and competition. Um, lithium mining is going to change though. Most of the really easily available and exploitable assets are going to be depleted sometime in the next 50 years. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we have ocean mining of, uh, of lithium here uh, sometime soon and, and new methods of lithium mining. Uh, I actually think that one of the better ways to uh, play the EV, uh, rather than buying, not one of the better ways, but if you wanted to bet on the EV industry without betting on individual EV companies, then I think buying a battery manufacturer is probably a much better way to go. Um so because there, no, no matter what happens, like lithium may not be the battery technology of the future. It may be some other technology. It could be sodium ion batteries, could be potassium ion batteries. It could be something that we haven't even conceived of at this point. Or I, I, I can't I can't think of, you have to have like the available electrons <laughs> to do this. Right. So I can't I can't think of anything off the top of my head that will replace those three types of cathode chemistries. And we have a lot of that research already mapped out uh, because it's a lot of the research that was done on lithium can be used with sodium and can be used with potassium, not all of it, but a lot of it can. So we actually kind of have a head start. So uh, potassium is like, so lithium, of course, is the most energy dense. Then you have potassium, which we're not doing a ton of research on right now. And below that, you have sodium ion batteries, which there's actually a lot of research going on that right now too. Sodium ion batteries, of course, are, are, or attractive because of the abundance of sodium. It's freaking everywhere, right? Um, but I, I think that a better way to play that, if you didn't want to take the risk of owning an individual EV stock, would definitely be to own uh, battery stocks. And I think that some of the larger players out there, like CATL, uh, and remember, Tesla is a battery company as much as it is a, 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 a you know EV maker. Uh, they're the fourth or fourth. Yeah, they're either they're, BYD and Tesla usually kind of like switch places as a who makes the more batteries per year. I think Tesla is probably pulling ahead of them at this point. Um, but they're one of the largest battery manufacturers on the planet. Not only that, they tend to acquire the technologies they want, right? Like they bought, uh, was it Maxwell Energy in, in, or Maxwell Solutions in San Diego? 
They bought a lithium mining company recently, and uh, they bought a couple of other emerging, um, you know, uh, battery technology companies. So um, I think that may be a better idea, definitely, to buy that battery manufacturer. It uh, it made me question what's really the relationship between the U.S. and China. So we're, we're not enemies. The U.S. and China, we're not enemies. We're economic rivals. And uh, I got to be honest with you guys. We're not necessarily always the good guys in, in any sort of action on the international stage. We really aren't. And I think that it's not unpatriotic to admit that our country is not perfect and, and we could we could be better and we could make better decisions and we could be less exploitative of people. So China is stepping into every mistake that we make and exploiting that economically. And they're doing it in a really intelligent manner. And I don't like it, right? But we're not enemies. We are simply economic rivals. And the sooner people realize that, the more we can start acting just like economic rivals. They're, they're economic rivals with us just like Germany is, you know, uh, just like uh, France is or something like that. They just We just happen to be not quite so friendly with them. Well, maybe more like France. We're not friendly with France either. So, uh, yeah. And so you are correct in this, that you should be questioning the environment, or the uh, relationship that's pushed on us by the media. There's no reason for us to be enemies. Um, Rad Toss is trying to help you out to get more views on YouTube. I'd love to get more views on YouTube. I think that the way to get more views on YouTube is for me to make more videos though, which I'm struggling to find the time to do that right now. Uh, I think after September, when October, November, December rolls around, I'm going to have some really, really good research that I've been working on for like months that's coming out. And I'm going to talk about some individual companies that I found really, really exciting. Uh, yeah, so very exciting. Uh, Ilan says, I'm Latvian who grew up in London and now I live in Bulgaria. So you speak Latvian, which is a, is Latvian a language isolate there? Is it, is it, is it was either Estonian, Lithuanian or Latvian was a, they were, they were like kind of a language isolates there, not really related to anything else around them. And then you speak Bulgarian and English. That's amazing. That's really amazing. Those are, those are like completely on, those are mostly unrelated languages. So uh, really cool. Uh, but you're right, Dubsatron, there's tons of American money in these companies. They have exploited U.S. capital markets to fund their economy, to fund the emergence of their economy. So um, Shoeless Joe says the negative reaction to crypto now is a lot like the re reaction to EVs five years ago. Actually, I think it's just, you're not here in the U.S., man. It's still like the negative reaction to EVs here. If you go to where if you go to where I'm from in Texas or where I was just visiting in, 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 in South Carolina and uh, Alabama and Tennessee, uh, you'd still see a negative reaction to EVs a long time ago. So, uh, and you're right. There's almost a universal knee-jerk reaction to disruptive ideas. But when that knee-jerk reaction to that disruptive idea is disrupting an industry that is so entrenched in um, in American culture, in our economy, like the energy industry, I think it's going to be even worse. And I think it's really to the detriment of most people who have jobs in the oil industry right now they are going to get really harmed by EVs coming out. Basically, like entire maintenance departments, and I'm talking about the, the, the oil industry, I'm talking about entire maintenance departments for dealerships are going to go away. Dealerships themselves, there are probably going to be a lot fewer of those uh, because a lot of the maintenance is going to go away with electric vehicles. There's nothing to maintain. There's a lot fewer moving parts. Uh, things don't wear out. You don't change oil. Uh, the only thing you do more often is change tires because EVs are heavier, right? Uh, but yeah, I, I think the negative reaction is is uh, is almost a childish reaction at this point. It's uh, almost I don't know if you ever saw the uh, like the the buggy. It's basically what buggy whip manufacturers must have felt like when they saw the first automobile. That's what oil field workers and uh, people that work at car dealerships and people that work at oil change places are feeling right now. They're going to get left behind, and I think that's a shame. If you are if, if you're an oil field worker, a petroleum engineer, you should have a plan. You should have a plan for if you become obsolete. That may happen. Uh, becoming obsolete is something that may happen to you, even if you aren't a part of, um, you know, even even if this doesn't happen as quickly as we think. So, um, have you done your research in how connected some of these uh, cryptocurrencies are? So I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that question, Deptatron. So are you talking about the Ethereum Alliance, the, the Linux Foundation, that sort of thing? Um, that has not been my angle of research. My angle of research has been how many of these cryptocurrencies are actually uh, <clears throat> really differentiate themselves. And the answer that I have come to with consultation from several experts in this field is that most cryptocurrencies are not unique. They don't do anything special. 
They don't do, <clears throat> you know, most cryptocurrencies don't do anything more than Ethereum does at this point or is planning to do. You have a couple of players out there like, like Algorand, Polkadot, Cardano, and one or two others that I'm not going to mention because I can't rem remember their names. But somebody's going to get upset that I forgot them. <clears throat> um, but yeah, somebody's going to get, but, but they aren't really all that different. And most of them are actually going to fail. And I even think that maybe one or two of my favorite cryptocurrencies projects are probably going to fail because there's only room for so many of them to be successful. So what really concerns me is the emergence of uh, like national currencies in digital form that could be problematic for decentralized crypto, right? Uh, people are going to be more comfortable. You know, if the United States suddenly developed the digital dollar and, and called it the, I don't know what they call it, like call it the, the electron back instead of the green back. I don't know. But if they, if they develop that, that would probably, uh, a lot of people would start using that rather than Bitcoin or Ethereum or Cardano or Algorand or something like that. And I think that's the real danger is these, uh, these countries, uh, is various national entities adopting uh, not a cryptocurrency strategy, but just a digital dollar strategy of some sort. I think that's a huge danger to, to cryptocurrency. I think there's always going to be a hardcore people um, that like cryptocurrency. Um, that hardcore people that really love cryptocurrency to begin with, let's be honest, it was all about criminals. It wasn't necessarily about the cryptology nerds. It was really about uh, the, the, the criminal element and transportable wealth and untraceable wealth, right? Um, for that reason alone, I think that cryptocurrencies are here to stay. Just like a lot of other emerging, emerging industries in the last 20th century, crime or vice was one of the keys that sort of helped it catch on. And I think that cryptocurrency is going to go that way too. Um, Martin Cusino says, hey, Jason, finally catching a live stream. I'm pretty late. Looking forward to listening to the whole thing. Uh, excellent. I'm sorry, Martin, but I never give you guys warning as far as when I'm going to be doing a live stream. Uh, I would love to do that, but honestly, I, I don't think I could give you guys more than 10 minutes or so. Uh, Dubstertron says, I've actually done research and found out that Goldman and JP Morgan have fund, uh, funded huge cryptocurrencies. Um, so they've been involved in the development of, of cryptocurrencies. They definitely see um, some of that uh, opportunity there. So Martin Kisuna says, can you give us your understanding of NEO's corporate structure in regards to NEO Capital and what impact it has to NEO's top line? For instance, Inceptio is funded by NEO Capital. What is the impact? Um, I think I'd rather do a video on that. Uh, so that's actually something that I've been wondering about myself. Um, so last year I did kind of, I did a, a, a deeper investigation on NEO's corporate structure and it's actually kind of changed since then, since they bought in, since they brought in the battery asset company and, and rearranged things. So that's changed. So I actually need to go back and research that. Uh, and that would be a good topic. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you though, as much as I love covering, um, covering EVs, it's getting a little bit tiring for me. Uh, I want to talk about other subjects too. Like I'd love to talk to you guys about genomics companies, but I tried earlier and you guys aren't interested, even though like Moderna has just started the human trial for an AIDS vaccine, which is absolutely freaking amazing. Um, I, I just think that uh, my audience is not necessarily inter interested in that. So I'm not going to tell you what to be interested in. I'm going to be interested in what you guys are interested in. And Martin, you've been a long time uh, you know, subscriber and you're part of my Patreon group. So I will take a look at that for you. And uh, I'll put together a video on Neo's corporate structure. Uh, so I'll do that. It'll be out in the next couple of weeks. So uh, I think that genomics is so complex and unpredictable. You're correct. You're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, but a small slice of that genomics puzzle right now is, uh, is M mRNA and uh, what we're doing right now to uh, target what, what's going on right now in that industry. There's a lot of light being shown on, on messenger RNA right now. And it's very, very exciting. Um, so, you know, I know that I, like I said, I've not covered Moderna stock a lot. I've talked about it a few times where I told people to be cautious about it, but I think that it has long-term legs and that really even at $400 a share, it might look undervalued 10 years from now. It really might. So, um, yep. And I think people kind of want more simple things and probably don't care much about technology as long as they make great returns on their investment. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. You know, uh, before Facebook came along, I thought that almost everyone had a basic understanding of science. 
and uh, an understanding that that expertise is something that should be uh, respected. Meaning that you know you you don't go up to an epidemiologist and say I disagree with you because of something I read on Facebook. Uh, that epidemiologist has probably been studying viruses for 45, 50 years, right? Uh, so it turns out that my assumption that most people were pretty smart and educated and uh, respected the expertise of other people, that was completely wrong. <laughs> I was completely wrong about that. Most people don't. Um, and, uh, and and it's part of this Dunning-Kruger curve that, that, I, that I really am just now starting to understand, right? Um, I've always been maybe not in my interpersonal relationships, but when it comes to facts and understanding and science, I've always been one of those people that's willing to say, hey, I was wrong about this. Let me change my mind. Now, if you ask my wife that whether I would change my mind on, on whether or not the house is dirty and it's my fault, she would say that I'm never going to change my mind on that, right? Never, never. But in, in terms of like actually looking at science, technology or something like that, I'm perfectly willing to change my opinion based on data. And I, I didn't realize, and this is an oversight on, on my part, this is part of my own social awkwardness here, I didn't realize that most people weren't like that, that they were uh, they they made a decision about what they wanted to believe in. And they were probably never going to change their minds on that. Uh, to me, that's one of the most fascinating things about humanity that I've discovered recently. Uh, like CNC, CC in New York City says, I don't think that pharmaceuticals are here to cure disease. They just want to prolong our life using drugs. Um, yeah, I think you're completely wrong about that. Um, and, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Scientists are the most competitive people on the planet. Uh, in fact, th there's one of the great sayings out there, one of the great memes I've seen out there. It was, it's posted on some like atheist group that I was reading one time. It says, uh, science, it says scientists are a bunch of assholes. All, are, all, they're, all they're trying to do is, uh, is trying to uh, do is trying to prove shit. So that's true. Scientists are a bunch of jerks and all they do is run around trying to prove things. Uh, but a lot of them make their reputation and make their living simply by not by ever proving something on their own, but by proving other people wrong. Scientists are some of the most competitive people on the planet, even though the stakes for them are so small. A lot of them really aren't paid very much. They, their, their payment is really in prestige. Their payment is in bragging rights. Their payment is getting one over on the other guy. And that's a very, very human thing. Uh, so the, you know, when, you, when you're looking towards a way to discover the truth and a way to discover the fact, the scientific method right now is really all that we have to do that, largely because it is so competitive and so chaotic. You make a claim. You have to back it up with evidence. You make a claim that this drug is effective. You have to back it up with evidence. Somebody's going to disagree with you. Somebody's going to come out with a better product. Somebody's going to prove that your product doesn't work or someone's going to prove that it does. Right? Uh, it's a, such a highly competitive environment. I just don't think that there's enough collusion there for people to sort of uh, prolong their life using drugs rather than curing disease. We are not gods when it comes to understanding how diseases work, especially how genomics works. You're looking at, you know, at, at, at three and a half billion base pairs of, of DNA that we have, each with a possible, I think it's, what was it? I think it's 24 different permutations per place. So if you look at like a computer language, it all boils down to ones and zeros. You basically have, you know, two different values, one or zero for each place. With a strand of DNA, it's it's a programming language as well. You have, I think it's 20, maybe actually less than that, but I think it's actually 24 possible permutations there that could be in that one place. This produces an infinitely more complex code that has to be read, and we don't really understand everything about it at this point. Um, and and that's and we're understanding now that genomics is the or genetics is the root of many causes of death. I've heard estimates as high as 30 percent of um, of deaths in in the world are related to actually genetic causes. Uh, and I don't remember where I read that. I don't, I don't quote me on that as far as that being 100% accurate, because it may not be, but that is a number that sticks in my head for some reason. Um, but especially these companies, uh, like if you're, de you're developing a, 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 an AIDS vaccine here from using messenger RNA technology, you're, you're doing it to cure the disease, not to treat it. So there's been lots and lots of money made on the treatment of disease, but a lot of these companies, they're a, a lot of the scientists that work for these companies uh, for number one, you cannot keep scientists quiet. Anything that has ever been really important that's been developed has never really been a surprise. Uh, there's always leaks. There's always things left in cafes. There's always you talking to your friends or that scientist talking to his friends because they want to brag about this. They have egos just like the rest of us. Um, unless there's been one or two government things that came out that were a complete surprise, like uh, uh, the Stuxnet 
Stuxnet project. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It was actually one of the first uh, truly successful acts of cyber warfare that involved, um, you know, Iran's uh, uh, Iran's um, centrifuge program that they were using to refine uh, uranium. That is one of the things that came out that was a secret that I was really genuinely surprised by. Most of the time when something comes out, there's usually hints of it beforehand. Um, and, and like really bald hints of it beforehand because the scientists are so competitive and their currency is credit. Their currency is, is, is getting credit for things that they created. It's not necessarily money. Uh, but if you don't know about the Stuxnet project, it's S-T-U-X-N-E-T -E project. Uh, it was a stunning intelligence victory well, it's still not clear. It was probably the United States and Israel that did this. There were probably less than a dozen people involved and maybe only three or four programmers worldwide who devi who, who devised this. Uh, the um, in fact, it was uh, I think it was uh, the New Yorker did an expose on that where they kind of determined that there were maybe like six people in Russia could do it, five people in Israel who could do it, and like six people here in the United States who could have done it. Those are the only people who could have possibly been involved in this project and could have written something that was quite that sophisticated. So, uh, yeah. And like that, that's another thing we should be talking about here too is cybersecurity. Uh, we're finally, and it, it's really only been in the last like 10 years that we're really seeing spectacular acts of, of cyber terrorism and cyber extortion that are out there. And I think that cybersecurity is one of those next great waves of, uh, of investment opportunity out there. Um, do you have any thoughts on popular meme stocks like Sensonics? No. I, I looked into that. I'm not impressed. Um, I looked at I, I looked at it and it was actually six months ago. I don't I don't think it was you that mentioned that originally. I think it was a guy named James. Um, it, was, it was a guy named James that mentioned that originally, but he did that along with Microvision. I did a um, a video on Microvision that I thought was mostly fair, but I was trying to get across that. It's a 25-year science project. They don't really have much in the way of revenues, and they don't really have much in the way of special technology that's been proven to work yet, right? Uh, Sensonics is one of those as well. Uh, it's a shot in the dark right now that has some money behind it in terms of uh, like private equity money, and they've been able to use the stock market to raise more money. I, I don't see um, that their diabetic treatment is really all that revolutionary or really it, that it really works. So... Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of my issue. Um, Mr. Slick says, here's sort of a random one. Have you ever heard, ever heard of Latch stock? Basically, it's some high-tech door lock. What are your thoughts? Never heard of it. Sorry, never heard of it. High-tech door lock? Never heard of it. Um, interesting, though. Uh, I, I tend not to be, the I, even though I'm from Texas, I tend not to be the kind of person that worries about home invasion and staying armed all the time and, and home security and, and all that, even though I live in Southern California now and only eight miles from the border, it's just not something that I think about all the time. I have regular door locks on my house. Um, how do you feel about Matterport for real estate? Why is that familiar? Matterport for real estate. Let me, uh, let me take a look at that real quick. Uh, Matterport for real estate. Um, Oh, and I, someone else just brought this to my attention and I haven't really had time to research this. Um, so I, I don't, yeah. So Matterport, the spatial data platform. Actually, maybe this is not something that someone brought to my attention recently. I'm confusing this with something else. So no, I don't know enough about that to comment on that. Sorry about that. Um, Matterport for real estate, interesting. It's still a stack, SPAC, but I believe it's an actual stock. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Slicks, I'm sorry. I just don't know about that. Uh, that's something I'll look into, but I'm going to admit it's going towards the bottom of my list at this point because I have a lot of other things to, 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 to look at. Um, anyway, guys, uh, it's been almost an hour and a half now, and uh, I want to go outside and play basketball with son for a little bit. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to say goodbye for today. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, I'll be coming out with more videos uh, later on in the week and on the weekend. And I will do another live stream next week. And also for folks who are in my Patreon group, we're doing a Patreon group only uh, live stream. We're going to do that on Monday. I haven't settled on the time yet, but bring a beer because we're all having beer while we're doing the live stream because, you know, my, my Patreon group is not that small. So I can personally greet everyone there and share a beer with you guys. Uh, thanks. It's been fun uh, hanging out with you guys. I will see you next time.